campus missions abroad were the topic of a hearing Monday on Capitol Hill. Officials from the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development testified before a House Government Reform Subcommittee. Congressman Chris Shays chaired this two-and-a-half-hour hearing. Quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled The President's Management Agenda, Right-Sizing the U.S. Presence Abroad, is called to order. After the guns stopped firing, the battle for freedom, peace, and security in Iraq and throughout the world will be con continue to be waged with words and ideas. Success in that global arena will be determined by the size, scope, and skill of the United States diplomatic presence abroad. Today, America's diplomatic front lines are staffed by more than 60,000 people representing up to 40 federal agencies working at 260 embassies and consulates worldwide. But that overseas posture appears to be the product of Cold War habits and bureaucratic inertia rather than any systematic effort to put the right people in the right places to advance U.S. interests. Currently, no one can even say with any accuracy how many executive branch employees are posted at foreign missions. No common accounting system measures the true costs of international activities by so many different federal agencies and programs. Ambassadors have little more than titular authority to manage the comings and goings of non-state department personnel. Many embassies are not safe, and new buildings are being built without reliable projections of how many people will have to work there. The President's management agenda calls for a right-sized overseas presence to better shape, focus, and secure the work of U.S. citizens and foreign nationals abroad. Today, we continue our assessment of how aggressively and effectively the State Department and the Office of Management and Budget are pursuing this important initiative. Last year, at the subcommittee's request, the General Accounting Office, GAO, undertook a series of studies to assess right-sizing efforts. To rationalize and standardize decision-making, GAO developed an analytical framework that gives priority to security, mission, and cost considerations. In two new reports released today, GAO recommends broader application of that framework and an improved process to derive the staffing projections upon which new embassy designs are based. More than a decade after the Cold War, five years after terrorists target our embassies in Africa, and 18 months since the attacks of September 11th, we still lack a systematic approach to determine who will be tasked to project U.S. ideals and policies into a more dynamic, more dangerous world. International economic, political, military, and cultural alignments are changing rapidly. The size and skill of U.S. diplomatic engagements must change with them. Sitting as one panel, all our witnesses this afternoon share one goal, a right-sized U.S. presence abroad that puts the right people with the right skills in secure facilities throughout the world. We truly appreciate their time, their dedication, and their expertise, and we look forward to their testimony, the dialogue that will take place among them, uh, and uh, with us as well as members of Congress. Mr. Kucinich. Thank you for being here, the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. Let me welcome our witnesses. Glad you could be with us today, and I want to begin by expressing my appreciation for the men and women who serve uh, this country, not only in the armed forces, but those who serve in the diplomatic corps at the many missions around the world. Mr. Chairman, the idea of right-sizing is sound. We should determine goals and priorities discern needed resources, and implement an efficient plan while balancing cost and security concerns. The, statement, uh, the State Department, indeed all agencies that utilize embassy space, should right-size. Not to do so would squander val valuable resources. 
But the concept of right-sizing is also broad. It forces us to ask whether this country is adequately supporting our international diplomatic corps in performing their critical mission. Recently, we've seen the dramatic impact diplomacy can make on this country's security when successful diplomacy has the potential to work wonders. In the wake of September 11th, Secretary of State Colin Powell assembled one of the largest coalitions in modern times challenging terrorism in Afghanistan. When diplomacy fails, however, it can have dire consequences. As we all know, the United Nations rejected the President's arguments for military action against Iraq. As a result, the President chose to launch this nation on a new and perilous course of action, embarking on a unilateral and unprovoked military attack without the support of the Security Council. Predictably, a majority of the world's nations do not support the President's action. Part of this, uh, the question is no doubt philosophical. What value does this administration place on the support of the international community? And part of the question is also resources. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I would like to provide some context. The President's budget for fiscal year 2004 proposes $9.8 billion for the State Department. This includes operations and maintenance for all embassies, consulates, and missions in every country. The President's budget proposes $379.9 billion for the Defense Department. In other words, the Defense Department will receive more than 38 times as much as the State Department. And this does not include about $63 billion in additional spending in the Supplemental Appropriations Bill to pay for the uh, first installment of the war in Iraq. If you include that amount, the Pentagon gets about 45 times as much as the State Department. As another example, the State Department has proposed $16 billion over the next 20 years to construct new embassies and secure existing U.S. structures around the world. Next year, they're seeking a relatively modest $890 million for new building construction. Yet the Defense Department expects to pay more than $60 billion for about 200 F-22 aircraft. Next year alone, the Pentagon will spend nearly $8.7 billion, almost the entire budget of the State Department just on missile defense programs. Consider the irony. The U.S. unilaterally withdrew from the ABM Treaty, a successful product of diplomacy, to spend almost the entire annual State Department budget, amount equal to the entire annual State Department budget, on a so-called missile defense system that's not been tested to work under realistic conditions. Some estimates uh, for that system top $200 billion. In contrast, Mr. Chairman, allow me to point out the findings of the Overseas Presence Advisory Board, whose report we will be dis discussing today. The panel noted the gap between our nation's goals and resources it provides its overseas operations. The world's most powerful nation does not provide adequate security to its overseas personnel. The overseas facilities of the wealthiest nation in history are often overcrowded, deteriorating, and even shabby. In addition to capital deficiencies, the panel also noted insufficiencies in staffing. Morale has suffered understaffing forces, many to work extensive overtime hours. Junior officers are often required to do back-to-back -back counselor tours on the visa line. However, the Bureau is unable to hire additional people to address workload problems because of funding limitations and strict employment ceilings. The panel made its conclusions in stark terms. The condition of U.S. posts, it said, and missions abroad is unacceptable. The panel fears that our overseas presence is perilously close to the point of system failure. Mr. Chairman, as this committee goes forward, I would point out that right-sizing is not the same as reducing, trimming, or consolidating, although each of these may occur. A true commitment to right-sizing includes a commitment to the men and women serving this nation and risking their lives abroad. In my opinion, right-sizing must also include a broad, aggressive new commitment to substantially greater funding, not just for security, but also for pay, for benefits, for training, recruitment, state-of-the-art communications, modern facilities, all of which are critical components of the essential diplomatic mission of the United States. It is time to recapitalize our international relations force. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Rumpersberger. Yes, first, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, look forward to the testimony today. Uh, in this global environment and in our current international climate, we need to make sure that our mission abroad has the resources and adequate personnel to address any of the issues that may arise. 
Now, this is a new time, and we, we must and we will face the challenges abroad, and you're going to be a, a major part of it. Uh, our overseas mission is one of the most vital functions of the federal government. We need to make sure that we have the right number of persons stationed at specific areas. We have to make sure that they have the right technical knowledge and expertise to address concerns and their designated assignments. There are many concerns and issues with U.S. presence abroad. It is my understanding that there is some difficulty in determining the number of personnel abroad, and it is even harder to determine the cost involved. And we need to make sure that our mission abroad has the personnel to do their jobs effectively. Now, I know the administration has tasked the OMB with right-sizing U.S. presence abroad. And I, I like the word right-sizing. Uh, I think a lot of times our personnel and government are always concerned that any type of restructuring is downsizing. It's more right-sizing and getting the right people in the right positions. Now, hopefully the, uh, this will provide for right-sizing action taken by the administration and to make sure that we have the adequate personnel. Uh, there's not one formula or there's not one solution that can be applied to every situation. For example, in one country, we may, we may need some narcotics specialists and field agents, while in another country, we may, we may need uh, a more cultural specialist. Um, one issue that we should be concerned about, though, is security for our personnel. Uh, I know that uh, we, I was with a group that was briefed by Secretary Powell. Um, I was very impressed with the presentation, talked about uh, the taking care and working with the infrastructure and, and a lot of our, our areas abroad and our embassies uh, that, that is needed. And there's, it's been a long time coming, and I, and I think that's uh, the right step. Uh, a few years ago, two of our African embassies were attacked. Again, we have to make sure that we focus on the issue of security. And since then, we have started work to help secure our facilities in all of these foreign nations. With the current war, I hope that our personnel have the protections that are necessary to keep them and their families safe. U.S. mission abroad is nuanced and faces serious, real threats. Hopefully, in today's hearing, we're going to get better insight into what is happening with U.S. staffing abroad. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this hearing. I thank the gentleman. At this time, uh, let me just take care of some housekeeping. I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee may be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. Without objection, so ordered. No objection. I ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I'll announce the panel and then I'll swear them in. Mr. Jess T. Ford, Director, International Affairs and Trade Division, U.S. General Accounting Office. The Honorable Ambassador Ruth A. Davis, Director General, U.S. Department of State. The Honorable Major General Charles E. Williams, retired Director, Overseas Buildings Office, U.S. Department of State. Mr. Richard Nigard, uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Management, U.S. Agency for International Development. The uh, Honorable uh, Ambassador Ann Sigmund, Acting Inspector General, U.S. Department of State. And the Honorable William E. Uh, H. Ito, uh, Acting Deputy Inspector General, U.S. Department of State. Uh, let me state at the outset that um, we could have divided this in two panels. We could have divided in three panels. We put you all together. Six is what we can fit on this table because we do want the exchange of dialogue. And I have a feeling that we probably aren't going to disagree on too many things here, maybe, but I doubt it. Um, but it would be healthy to to have you respond to questions, and then if uh, someone has answered a question, you want to qualify it or say how you agree or disagree and with some nuance, it would be helpful as well. Um, at this point, if you would uh, stand and raise your right hand, we'll swear you in. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Note for the record that all of our witnesses who respond in the affirmative, and I think we have you by the order I read also in line here, so we can uh, just go that way. And we'll just start with you, Mr. Ford. Uh, as you know, um, uh, we do five minutes and then we give you another five minutes so the light will be green and, and then red and then it'll go to green. But uh, as close to five minutes as you can be would be helpful. But we want you to put on the the record and publicly the things that you feel need to. So 
uh, we're happy to do a little listening. All right? It's fine. Mr. Ford. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's work on right-sizing of overseas presence. That is, deciding the number and types of personnel that should be assigned to our embassies and consulates. U.S. overseas presence is significant, with more than 60,000 Americans and foreign nationals at over 260 posts overseas. Because of the security threats facing many of our embassies, we are, which are heightened due to the current war in Iraq, as well as changes in foreign policy, missions, and priorities, and the high costs of maintaining our significant presence, this effort is vitally important. Today, I will discuss three reports which we have issued on right-sizing issues since I testified before this subcommittee last May, two of which are being released today. These re reports describe the right-sizing framework that we developed last year, the results of applying the framework in developing countries, and the processes used to project staffing levels for new embassy construction and the proposals to share construction costs among U.S. agencies. In July of 2002, we presented a right-sizing framework that provides a systematic approach for assessing overseas workforce size. The framework is a set of questions designed to link staffing levels to three critical elements of overseas diplomatic operations, missions and priorities, physical and technical security, and the cost of operations. The framework also provides right-sizing options that decision-makers could consider to adjust embassy staffing levels. In our report, we recommended that OMB use it as a basis for assessing staffing levels as part of the administration's right-sizing initiative. According to OMB, they are using this framework as part of their ongoing study of staffing at embassies and consulates in Europe and Eurasia. Following our report in July, and in, re in response to your request, we examined whether our framework could be applied at U.S. embassies in developing countries. Today, we are issuing a report on this work. Our analysis of three embassies that we have visited in West Africa indicates that the right-sizing framework can be implied in that environment. We found that if embassies use our framework to complete a full and comprehensive analysis of their services and their support to other embassies, then staffing levels could possibly be adjusted at some of the region's posts. For example, we report that possible right-sizing actions that could be taken at three posts include regionalizing certain operations and exploring outsourcing at some of some support services. Based on our work, it is clear that our framework has broad applications and that it provides a logical and common sense approach to systematically considering right-sizing issues in both developed and developing countries. We are recommending that OMB, in coordination with the State Department, expand the use of our framework in assessing staffing levels at all U.S. embassies and consulates. We are also recommending that the State Department include the framework as part of its mission performance planning process. Today, we are also issuing a report that demonstrates how the lack of a systematic process for de determining staffing requirements can have serious repercussions in State Department's embassy construction program. The State Department has embarked on a multi-year, multi-billion dollar facility replacement program. State plans to build new facilities at about 185 locations around the world at an estimated cost of $16 billion. The size and cost of these facilities depend on staffing projections that U.S. embassies develop. Based on our analysis of 14 posts where state plans to build new embassy compounds, we found that agencies are not developing staffing projections using a systematic approach or comprehensive right-sizing analyses. Officials at the posts we visited approached the processes in different ways. For example, some of the better posts solicited inputs from all agencies and held several meetings at a high level to discuss future needs, while others, other embassies, developed requirements without serious effort or review. Although embassies play a key role in the projection process, the State Department headquarters officials did not provide embassies with much formal guidance 
on the factors that they should consider when setting requirements. Nor did they stress the importance of accurate projections. Moreover, at each of the posts that we visited, we found little or no documentation to show that staff had compiled a comprehensive assessment of the numbers and types of people they would need in the year to which the compound was to be completed. In fact, a failure to account for recent growth in current staffing levels at one embassy we visited led to final projections that were too low and may result in significant overcrowding in the new facility. Further complicating the process is the frequent turnover of embassy personnel who did not maintain documentation on projection exercises or the factors they considered when developing projections. Finally, the staffing projections are not consistently vetted with all the agency's headquarters. Building secure and modern facilities for the thousands of U.S. government employees working overseas is extremely important and will require a significant investment. However, without a systematic process, the U.S. government risks building wrong-sized facilities, which could lead to security concerns, additional costs, and other inefficiencies and, in, and overcrowding. To help ensure that the U.S. government builds right-sized facilities, we are recommending that the State Department ad adopt a more disciplined and systematic process for projecting staffing requirements. State has indicated that it plans to implement our recommendations. The report also discusses the administration's plan to require agencies to pay a greater share of costs associated with our overseas presence. Currently, most U.S. agencies are not required to fund capital improvements to overseas facilities. While we have not analyzed the cost-sharing proposals in detail, the concept of agencies paying a fair share of costs has the potential to put more incentive in careful right-sizing of staff staffing needs. OMB is working with state and other agencies through an interagency committee to develop a cost-sharing mechanism that would provide more discipline when determining U.S. government overseas staffing needs. The administration is committed to implementing greater cost-sharing among, among agencies that use overseas facilities because it believes that if it, agencies pay a portion of the costs commensurate with their overseas presence, they will think more carefully before posting people overseas. There are numerous issues that will need to be resolved for the cost-sharing program to be successful, such as how to best structure the program, how changes will be determined, and how payments will be made. Mr. Chairman, the concept of right-sizing is, is as important today as it was following the bombings of our embassies five years ago. The key elements of our right-sizing framework, security, mission, cost, and right-sizing options, need to be considered collectively to determine embassy staffing and decision makers need to be looking for alternative ways of conducting business. Our work in the past year has further demonstrated the feasibility of achieving a systematic and comprehensive approach. Such an approach can have substantial payoffs if OMB, state, and other agencies operating overseas support it. I believe we all recognize that to be successful, right-sizing will be a long-term effort requiring the commitment of all agencies operating overseas. I am encouraged that the momentum for developing a meaningful approach to right-sizing continues. Both the State Department and OMB have endorsed our right-sizing framework and are working together with other agencies to improve the process. Our recommendations to support <coughs> uh, this process in our reports issued today should help ensure that this momentum continues. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ford. Uh, Ambassador Davis. Thank you very much. I don't think your mic is on. I, I've never looked. Does the light come on when they're on? Yeah. Okay. I think it's on, it's, it's on now. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Good Chairman. Afternoon. And other members of you the You got a great smile. Nice way to start out my day. I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy for your interest. Uh, I'm really very pleased, as I said, to participate in this hearing on the President's management agenda, right-sizing the U.S. presence abroad. The Department of State welcomed the decision to include right-sizing as one of the initiatives of the President's management agenda. 
We're working very closely with the Office of Management and Budget as it leads the interagency effort to move the initiative forward. And we are committed to working with OMB in the development and implementation of a successful right size initiative. The General Accounting Office has kept us informed of the status of its right sizing work, including the right sizing framework that it has developed. GAO has stated that right sizing means aligning the number and location of staff assigned overseas with foreign policy priorities and security and other constraints. GAO notes that right sizing may result in the addition or reduction of staff or in a change in the mix of staff at a given embassy or consulate. We agree with that. We do not believe that the right sizing necessarily means, we don't agree that right sizing necessarily means downsizing, quite the contrary. We are in the second year of increased hiring with our diplomatic readiness initiative, the DRI. DRI was launched by the Secretary of State with congressional support to address the serious staffing gaps created during the 1990s when we hired under attrition. This initiative seeks to strengthen our U.S. diplomatic corps with almost 1,200 new hires beyond attrition, and we are grateful for your support. These new positions will allow us to fill unmet needs overseas and to provide for enough personnel to respond to crises and to go to training without leaving uh, staffing gaps. The DRI is therefore a part of our efforts to have the right size State Department staffing overseas to meet our mission requirements. GAO lists three elements as part of its right-sizing framework, security, mission, and cost. We strongly believe that the top priority is without question mission. The first question that must be asked before all others is whether the United States has a compelling reason to be in a particular location. If the answer is yes, then it may be necessary to place personnel there, even in the face of serious security concerns or excessive cost. As an example, the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. But if we're going to have people overseas, we must ensure their security as best as we can and at the lowest possible cost. Mission requirements can change, as you well know, and we have a dynamic system to respond to these changes. Now, now let me address what the department is ultimately responsible for, our own staffing overseas and how we manage our overseas presence. Right-sizing is an ongoing process. We continually review changing priorities and emerging issues and make staffing changes between regions or between functions, reallocating people so that higher priority needs are met. We have done this recently by putting more people overseas in consular sections to meet increased border security needs Host and regions have moved resources to meet the priority counterterrorism mission at the expense of lesser priorities. Sometimes we can accomplish this without strain because other requirements are in decline. But oftentimes we pull people to address new issues while old ones still exist. With the increased staffing under the DRI, we will have a better capacity to respond without leaving day-to-day -day work neglected. Ultimately, right-sizing of the State Department staffing is accomplished through our strategic planning and budgeting process and is supported by our workforce planning process. Chiefs of Mission 
have the primary responsibility for deciding U.S. staffing and their missions. They are in the best position to make decisions on staffing needs that accurately reflect U.S. foreign policy priorities. Their mission performance plans cover the policy objectives of the entire mission, including all other agencies. The department's regional bureaus review and use these mission plans to prioritize and justify position requirements in support of strategic goals. Bureaus request any additional staffing in their performance plans at an agency annual senior policy and re resource review chaired by the deputy secretary. To assist the department's leadership in assessing staffing needs and requests, we have the overseas staffing model. This workforce planning tool identifies the staffing requirements at overseas posts based on specific categories and criteria and provides a comparative assessment of posts. The OSM evaluates each post rationally using key workload and host country factors. We use the results of the OSM as a baseline in assessing staffing needs and then add to our assessment the recent changes in foreign policy requirements that are not captured in the model, such as the changes needed for staffing in Kabul. The new hires under the Diplomatic Readiness Initiative are being placed overseas based largely on needs identified in the OSM. The department's senior leadership makes final decisions on the department's staffing requirements and hiring plans based on emerging priorities, funding potential, overseas staffing model projections, as well as the senior reviews. This ensures that staffing decisions are made in support of mission requirements. We believe that the strong linkage between strategic priorities and resource decisions with senior management involved ensures our ability to meet our mission. Other important factors in our strategic planning process include the use of local hires, security, staff reallocation to meet crises, and regionalization. Maintaining a safe environment overseas is a top priority for the Secretary of State. So we look for ways to ensure that we are not doing functions overseas that would be, be better done in the United States or via regional centers. The Department of State has looked at administrative, consular, and certain policy functions in various regions, and we have regionalized some of these functions. We've put people in more centralized locations, either overseas or in the United States, from which they now support multiple posts. This regionalization is consistent with both our right-sizing efforts and the principle of universality. While we maintain universality of our embassies, many functions can be managed regionally. State makes extensive use of regional offices with regional centers and locations such as Charleston, South Carolina, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and at major overseas hubs such as Frankfurt and Bangkok. All of these considerations, mission, security, cost, are part of our decisions on overseas staffing. Let me close by saying that we are working with OMB on its right-sizing effort as part of the President's management agenda. We believe that it is the appropriate mechanism to further study this issue. Thank you for your interest in this issue and for your support of our overseas presence. And I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, just so I'm clear, when we talk of the Director General, does that make you head of the Foreign Service and, and in charge of all personnel for, yes. for the Department of State? For the Department of State. Okay. I'm the Director General uh, of Personnel, uh, Director General of Human Resources, 
and the director of human resources, <coughs> which in, includes all personnel in the Department of the State. The term director general is used only in your case, or are there other? Yes. yes. The, there is only one director general. It's a general. great title. OK. Right. General. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Shays and other members of the subcommittee. Uh, for this opportunity to discuss with you the role of the Overseas Buildings Operations, OBO, uh, in implementing the President's management agenda, a directive toward right-sizing the U.S. presence abroad. The OBO mission, uh, reshaped by the 1998 bombings of our embassies in Dar es Salaam, uh, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya, and was reinforced uh, by the 9-11 event is to accelerate construction of new facilities that can satisfy the department's stringent security requirements and provide domestic, uh, provide our diplomatic personnel with safe, secure, and functional office and residential environments. Right-sizing the U.S. presence overseas will help uh, OBO ensure that we have the right facilities in place to conduct the effective U.S. foreign policy. As you know, Congress and the executive branch have identified uh, the overseas building operations in the State Department as the single property management for diplomatic, consular, and other related uh, civilian support properties of the United States overseas. I want to take the opportunity now to thank the Congress for its recent efforts and reinforcing uh, this single manager role as recommended by the GAO. When I joined Secretary Powell's transition team early on in December of 2000 to evaluate the Department's overseas facility status and program, I reviewed the Inman report, uh, the Crow report, the overseas presence at advisory panel report and anything else I could get my hands on because the files were quite hefty. All of these reports, in summary, basically said the same thing. We were experiencing facilities overseas that were uh, unsafe, many of them, uh, many not uh, secured, and of course overcrowded. And as, as a result of that, we were creating and presenting a very negative image for our uh, country. Our government currently employs about 60,000 people uh, represented from 30 or so agencies at those 260 overseas posts. The Diplomatic Security Bureau of the Department has concluded that at least, at least 160 of these posts do not meet current security standards and should be replaced by new embassy compounds. Over the last two years, we have already seen significant uh, uh, successes in being able to bring on board a program that would attack this problem. Uh, we have had successes in cutting costs. We have put in place standard embassy designs. We have an integrated design review process and we have put our program on a fast track. Uh, in the 19, and I'm sorry, in the FY02 awards, uh, we presented savings uh, of six to five million dollars, and we also anticipate in substantial savings in 03 by using best practices. Let me briefly address the reforms that we have put in place uh, to manage this program. First of all, Mr. Chairman and member, I would like to report that uh, we now have uh, developed a capacity to manage uh, at least $1.8 billion of work per year. Uh, we obviously um, had a closeout year last year to 1.75. Uh, we have increased the contractor pool from three contractors uh, two years ago, participating in our work to 15. Uh, this gives us a tremendous capacity to move forward. We have restructured the entire organization around a results-based uh, operational concept, and this is yielding us tremendous uh, results. We have set up a systematic process now for gathering information 
uh, for our long-range plan. Uh, this was the first strategic document that we put in place during the first six months of our tenure. This plan now guides our program uh, over a six-year period. It is currently in its second year of, of uh, being, and uh, it is uh, causing uh, a very good framework and a roadmap uh, to accomplish our work. We have also established an industry advisory panel. Uh, nine members from industry advises us uh, on a quarterly basis on the best practices from industry. We have chartered an interagency uh, facilities council to facilitate the interaction among the agencies who operate and do business in our platforms. Uh, we have uh, also uh, put in place, as I mentioned before, uh, standard designs so that now we can uh, move very quickly with our process. We reduce the time from the traditional four and a half years to two years for uh, construction, and we have an integrated process for all of the uh, vetting partners. We are getting results, uh, Mr. Chairman and member, and, uh, and to that extent, uh, the Congress has been um, has responded and, uh, and provided us with uh, uh, some additional funds, not all that we would like to have. As I mentioned, the capacity is at 1.8, and uh, we have a program which is slightly under a billion dollars uh, this year. But I do want to report that uh, we have 22 new embassy complexes underway. Uh, we'll be cutting the ribbon uh, this year for the first time uh, for eight new complexes. The average for our department through many, many years, at, as far as we can research, showed the maximum of two per year. Uh, we have opened the facilities in Tunis. We have opened facilities in Dar es Salaam, uh, both uh, our embassy and our USAID facility, also in uh, Nairobi. We're planning in the next uh, couple of months facilities in Istanbul, Zagreb, Istanbul, Turkey, Zagreb, Croatia, uh, Abu Dhabi in the Emirates, Sao Paulo in Brazil, etc. So we'll have eight new openings uh, this uh, year. In much the same way, we will have 10 groundbreakings as well. So we are getting results and things are moving along very nicely for us. Um, also, we have instituted a, uh, we've launched a new initiative. Uh, this new initiative is uh, cost sharing. Uh, this was highlighted in the Overseas Presence Advisory Panel uh, at that time um, uh, referred to as a rent surcharge type of uh, program. Uh, this cost sharing program will allow uh, those participating tenants to pay a cost uh, associated with the type seat that uh, they would be requesting from the State Department. We think, uh, Mr. Chairman and Committee, that a combination of the introduction of standard designs, where we have parametrically built a, a building size uh, to control cost, and we've significantly reduced the time for delivery, and linked to this new initiative of cost sharing will serve as a very good uh, path forward for our colleagues to connect the right sizing uh, uh, methodology to. Again, I appreciate the opportunity of, uh, of appearing before you, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you, General Williams. Uh, Mr. Nygaard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is the light on? I don't think you're, is your light on? There it is. Okay. Have it. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to appear before you today to discuss the efforts of the U.S. Agency for International Could you move the mic a little closer to you? Sure. Thank you. To assure that the number of U.S. staff deployed overseas is the right number to assure effective and efficient planning and management of programs. We have reviewed the three criteria proposed by the General Accounting Office for determining overseas staffing levels. We agree with them, and we've been using them in setting our field staffing levels, though perhaps not in a fully systematic way. 
USAID is a critical instrument of U.S. foreign policy. The agency carries out development, transitional, and humanitarian assistance programs in more than 150 countries and maintains some 70 bilateral and regional field missions abroad. We have found that a significant field presence is key to the success of our program. There are two main reasons for our overseas presence, influence and oversight. Our overseas employees understand the capacity of our programs and the needs of the countries in which they work, and their presence helps assure successful results. Their presence also promotes programmatic and financial accountability. Our people oversee the work being done by contractors and grantees who implement our programs. The main determinants of USAID's overseas presence are effective program management, or mission, and cost. Security has also taken on increased importance in recent years and will be a major factor in the future. The agency has been right-sizing its overseas presence for many years. The number of U.S. direct hire staff posted overseas by our agency has fallen from 1,256 in 1990 to 687 as of last September 30th, despite level or rising assistance levels worldwide and the expansion of USAID operations to 27 countries in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union in the past 13 years. Individual country missions are therefore significantly smaller than they were 15 years ago. USAID has taken a number of measures to keep the costs of our overseas presence to a minimum. We work with the Department of State and other overseas agencies of the U.S. government to provide common administrative services through the International Combined Administrative Services System. ICAS has proved very effective for allocating costs fairly among users, and all agencies are working to make it a stronger tool for efficiency as well. USAID is currently providing ICAS services to other agencies at nine posts where it is cost effective to do so. We provide certain services, contracts, finance, and legal through regional, office in some part, regional offices in some parts of the world. We use modern information technology to facilitate both voice and data communications among our field missions, USAID headquarters, and the offices of our contractors and grantees. We utilize our Foreign Service national staffs in recipient countries for professional as well as support work, reducing the costs of many functions without sacrificing quality. And we have closed down USAID missions in countries where our work has been completed. Over the past five years, overseas missions in Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and the Baltic Republics has been closed as programs in those countries ended. An area where the factors of cost and security come together is that of office space for our field missions. USAID must assure that our overseas staff work in the safest possible environment. Consistent with the Secure Embassy and Counterterrorism Act of 1999, the agency seeks to co-locate with embassies wherever possible. At present, we're co-located in less than half of our overseas posts. We've worked closely with General Williams and his office over the past two years to assure that USAID is an active participant in the Department of State's worldwide building program. Our fiscal 2003 appropriation provides funding for a USAID building on the embassy compound in Nairobi. We will continue to work with state and with the Congress to assure that safe and secure facilities are provided for our overseas staff. USAID is also undertaking a number of additional steps related to overseas right sizing, including the following. We're updating our financial, procurement, and other business processes to be more efficient and effective, increase the provision of services regionally, and adopt common information technology and process approaches worldwide. We're exploring with the Department of State the extent to which our financial systems and operations can be integrated. An initial study has demonstrated the feasibility of at least partial integration. Next steps will include determining the specifics of putting portions of our systems together. We're developing a template or model for a standard overseas USAID mission to permit the optimum allocation of what will continue to be limited human resources to best fulfill our mission. And we're finalizing a comprehensive human capital plan that will describe the specific core competencies needed by overseas staff 
for effective and efficient agency operations and the steps that must be taken, such as recruitment and training, to produce those competencies. As you're aware, Mr. Chairman, President Bush has stipulated that the right-sizing of overseas official U.S. presence will be a part of his management agenda. We look forward to building on our efforts to date, working with the Office of Management and Budget, the Department of State, and other overseas agencies to find broad, lasting approaches to assuring the most effective overseas presence. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I'll be happy to respond to any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Maggard. Um, we'll now hear from um, uh, the Acting Inspector General, uh, Ms. Sigmund. Mr. Chairman, members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity this afternoon to comment on the Department's right-sizing initiatives. The Department has made real progress in its right-sizing of its overseas posts. The Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations has introduced significant uh, improvements in planning and management that bring transparency and sound business practices to the construction of suitable and safe facilities for U.S. government personnel overseas. The Department is defining more systematically personnel requirements through its overseas staffing model and working with geographic bureaus energetically to right-size embassies. The Department should be commended for aggressively recruiting much-needed foreign service staff under its Diplomatic Readiness Initiative. Acknowledging the sacrifices that staff and their families make in serving in many parts of the world, the Department is looking for creative ways to mitigate the hardships of service at some posts where staffing gaps often exacerbate already difficult conditions. The emphasis the Department is placing on right-sizing today, however, cannot immediately resolve problems that are the result of inadequate planning in earlier years, insufficient resources, or inherently difficult environments which can change from benign to dangerous overnight. Of the 48 embassies we inspected since January 2002, we found a number of posts to be right-sized in terms of staff. Among them are Oslo, Helsinki, Stockholm, Freetown, Monrovia, and Abidjan. However, we also found embassies with deteriorating buildings without setback and key positions unfilled or staffed by officers committed but without the necessary experience and sometimes supervision always to do their jobs well. In addition, since January 2002, we completed 49 security inspections. Only nine posts had sufficient setback, 40 did not. We found inadequate staffing, lack of workspace, and unsafe facilities to be acute in Africa and in the new independent states. In Nigeria, for example, Embassy Abuja suffers from an inability to fill many mid-level positions. This was true in 1993 and 1997 when we inspected Nigeria. It was still true in 2002 when we returned. At the same time, U.S. government agencies are placing a greater priority on Nigeria with a concomitant increase in programs. The embassy does not have the staff or infrastructure to support this expansion. The NSDD 38 process is an important tool for right-sizing. However, we find that some agencies lose sight of NSDD 38 in their haste to implement programs. The assignment of advisors directly to host government entities or back-to-back -back temporary duty personnel circumvents NSDD 38 and undermines the efforts of chiefs of mission to right-size. To take Nigeria once more, much of the growth of Embassy Abuja and the consulate in Lagos, Lagos have been the result of added positions from other U.S. government agencies. A number of these new positions are currently listed as temporary and are not subject to the NSDD 38 review. The Department is developing regional support centers to alleviate staffing and administrative problems at some posts. Consolidated services out of Frankfurt, directed to the Balkans and the NIS, and out of Florida for the embassies of Latin America, are proving to be effective mechanisms for supporting posts, particularly those where staffing gaps and lack of administrative experience have a negative impact on operations. 
Frankfurt is also beginning to provide valuable consular support for African posts. In recent inspections of Port of Spain, Georgetown, and Paramaribo, OIG found that all three receive excellent support from the Florida Center that is miti mitigating the negative effects of staffing gaps. I would also note that in keeping with OPAP's support for phasing out of the Financial Services Center in Paris and moving its functions to Charleston, the department expects to complete the project this year, at which time Charleston will provide financial services to 84 posts previously serviced by FCS Paris. Finally, I would like to comment briefly on GAO's proposed framework for right-sizing. The framework provides a clear articulation of criteria that should be considered in determining mission size. The department has begun to incorporate right-sizing guidelines in its mission performance plan process. I want, however, to introduce a cautionary note. Although not implicit in the framework, there is the potential for drift in staffing size. The staffing of an embassy should not become only a reflection of the agencies that can afford to be there. Mission and the national interest are critical in defining the most effective personnel profile for an embassy in any given country. Policy objectives must be clearly defined and agreed to by all. Important to remember, too, is that no building, regardless of the resources and planning it represents, can ever be completely safe. The security of an embassy is not merely the sum of protections a building can provide, but the totality of programs, procedures, and host country relationships that embassy management uses to supplement the physical limitations of its buildings. In the last analysis, some degree of risk will always remain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to respond to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sigmund. Um, at this time, we will uh, invite um, William uh, Ito to, to comment, and uh, then we'll have a little dialogue um, and kind of get at this stuff. I'm going to be questioning whether my staff is telling me the truth, so you all are going to get in the middle of a little internal fight here. <laughs> Mr. Ito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. As a member and executive secretary of the Overseas Presidents Advisory Panel, I'm pleased to give you my personal perspective on recent efforts to respond to the issues that we highlighted in our report. I want to emphasize that I'm speaking today in my OPAP role, not as the acting deputy inspector general. At the time of the release of the OPAP report, we emphasized the need to consider our recommendations in their entirety. We recognized, however, that in election year and in the transition to a new administration, we could not realistically expect a wholesale adoption of our proposals. A number of our recommendations relating to security, human resources, information and communications technology, consular services, administrative services, and ambassadorial authority were embraced by the department. The department continues to work towards full implementation of many of those recommendations. OPAP's recommendations on the management and financing of overseas facilities called for the creation of a new government corporation, the Overseas Facilities Authority. We envisioned the OFA as an organization following private sector practices which could manage the construction and operation of our facilities overseas with costs allocated proportionally to all agencies. Linking facilities costs to staffing decisions would not only create a more equitable means for sharing those costs, but could also reinforce our efforts on right-sizing by identifying for each agency the real costs of assigning personnel overseas. The OPAP proposal on overseas facilities generated a great deal of discussion, and the department did not accept our recommendation on the creation of a new OFA. However, with the arrival of Secretary Powell, the Secretary agreed to seek solutions to the many issues we raised, short of creating a new entity outside of the department. As a result, FBO was taken out of the Bureau of Administration and restructured as the Bureau of Overseas Building Operations in May of 2001. Under the direction of General Williams, OBO has moved to become a more results-based organization run on private sector lines. OBO has developed a five-year capital program plan that provides long-term planning for the construction of new facilities and security upgrades for many existing facilities. 
I believe that much has been accomplished to implement many of the OPAP recommendations which should address the deficiencies that we found in the past. In addition to our proposals regarding facilities overseas, our OPAP recommendations on right sizing generated considerable debate within the department. OPAP found that there was no overall system to link the size and composition of our missions to the primary foreign policy goals of those missions. While the International Affairs Strategic Plan outlined executive branch goals in foreign policy, actual decisions on agency staffing overseas seemed coincidental to the goals stated. The mission performance plan required of each embassy received little feedback from Washington and was almost irrelevant to the allocation of resources. The NSDD 38 process seemed to be broken. Staffing decisions appeared to be largely based on the success of various agencies in obtaining the, national, the necessary support from Congress for additional positions abroad. OPAP recommended a permanent interagency committee created by the President and chaired by the Secretary of State to establish the criteria to be used in determining the size and composition of our overseas missions. The committee would determine appropriate staffing levels at all of our embassies based on an understanding of our foreign policy objectives. This was to clearly link mission size to mission objectives and was meant to be a dynamic process making adjustments as necessary. We use the term right sizing to describe the proper allocation of resources to mission objectives, but we cautioned that right sizing and downsizing were not necessarily synonymous. In some cases, we would have to increase staffing levels at some posts to reflect changing circumstances while reducing staff elsewhere. We believed, however, that real savings could accrue to the government over time if right sizing were embraced, along with many other recommendations to improve our operations abroad including proper cost allocations by agency, safer and better facilities, improved communications, consolidation of certain administrative functions, and improved human resource practices, including training. At the time of the release of the OPAP report in November 1999, the Department did not accept the principal recommendation among our proposals for right sizing, namely the creation of an interagency panel on right sizing to be established by the President. However, the panel at the time believed that any serious effort at right sizing could only come through a process initiated by the White House that clearly had the President's strong support. The right sizing recommendations of OPAP were included in the report of the Independent Task Force on State Department Reform published in January 2001 and conveyed to the incoming administration of President Bush. In August 2001, the President's management agenda was released and included right sizing as a major goal of the administration with OMB leading an effort to establish a comprehensive overseas staffing allocation process. The White House, through OMB, has established an interagency working group to look at overseas presence issues, starting with fundamental questions such as the real costs associated with having personnel overseas. OMB's role in the budget process gives it leverage in using budget levels to force agencies to provide justification for positions overseas. Within the Department of State, an effort is underway to address right sizing by using a strategic planning framework and by improvements into the Mission Performance Plan and Bureau Performance Plan process. The Department and USAID are committed to complete a joint strategic plan by June of 2003. Elements of strategic human capital planning and embassy right size planning are included in the draft 2004 to 2009 strategic plan, as well as in the MPPs and the BPPs. With the new strategic plan and a much more rigorous MPP and BPP process, we will have in place the foundations for an effective means of linking resource allocations to policy objectives. From an OPAC perspective, what still needs to be done is to create a right-sizing process that clearly applies to all agencies overseas. It is my judgment that we also need to do a better job of looking at long-term trends and developments and to make that part of a process of defining our foreign policy goals. The International Affairs Strategic Plan, last issued in 2000, should be updated and should reflect the views of all agencies operating overseas. Once such a comprehensive statement of foreign policy goals is established, there should be a coherent process to make responsible allocations of resources across all agency lines. That is the essence of our OPAP recommendation on right sizing. I am encouraged that many of the OPAP conclusions and recommendations on overseas presence and right sizing have been accepted though by any assessment, we still have far to go. As the agency traditionally responsible for shaping and executing our foreign policy abroad, the State Department must continue to demonstrate a strong interest in making any process of right-sizing an effective one. 
Other agencies must see it in their own interest to carry out their specific functions as part of an effective country team. The White House must bear ultimate responsibility for making any right-sizing process work across agency lines. Finally, Congress will have an important contribution to make as you consider the proposals that will come before you as we try to make, establish a more effective process for shaping our overseas presence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ito. I, um, I think this is a huge issue. Um, it, I think we had you know, some pretty long presentation and it seems like it's a lot of numbers and formulas and so on. But uh, for me, going to an embassy and seeing such de dedicated workers, but looking at their facilities just from the standpoint of security, uh, we pack people in. They're practically in hallways in some places. And then we have to have places for them all to live. I was amazed, amazed this is maybe a strong word, I was very surprised to, to realize how we break down um, how, how few in the State Department are actually, um, for, how, how few people in our embassies are actually in the State Department. And um, I'm, I'm looking for that, for the, uh, it was 39%. It's about one third, sir. Yeah, it just blows me away. Uh, and then defense is 40%. I, I noticed transportation 1% and treasury and so on. In May of 2001, we had a hearing on right sizing and we had the tenants. You know what I mean by tenants? Other agencies. Other agencies. Yeah, that's kind of what the State Department feels it's like. It's a, it's a tenant for all the other agencies. So let me just ask in terms of, and not that these missions aren't important, but let me just ask you in terms of, of cost. And I'll start with you, Mr. Ford. Is it likely that you were able to, to attach the true cost to every person who uh, is assigned to an embassy and the, uh, the payment had to be made by the department that sent them there? Is it likely that we might see uh, less people in some of our facilities? In other words, all the costs, not just the salary, uh, the staff support, uh, the facility, and if it's a U.S. government facility, the cost of that facility, sec and security, all the things added to it, their housing. Uh, as far as I know, we, there's nobody in the, the government knows what those costs are. Uh, OMB is in the process of trying to identify uh, costs for all of the tenants, as was mentioned earlier, uh, at overseas posts. Uh, I noticed in their uh, statement for the record, uh, they had some very interesting numbers uh, uh, for um, the different costs for individuals in the same agency. For example, uh, I think they had the FBI. Uh, they showed the cost of an FBI agent in three different locations, and the cost varied. Uh, I don't have their statement here in front of me, but as much as a couple hundred thousand dollars, uh, which indicates to me that uh, either the estimates aren't very good or the FBI uh, needs to take a hard look at how it uh, assigns its people, since uh, if they have uh, an agent at one place, it costs three times as much as another. Uh, they may not want to make that kind of investment. But the bottom line is uh, the overall cost by agency overseas, as far as I know, is not known. And I know that that's one of the key objectives of the OMB project. I don't know where they are with it right now in terms of whether they feel like they can um, give hard numbers. But I think that's one of the first things you need to find out before you make the right kind of decisions about who you're going to sign overseas. Okay, what, what, um uh, Ms. Sigma, do you have anything to add to the comments that were made by Mr. Ford? Uh, with respect to costs? Uh, yeah, I, he didn't really answer the one question I asked, though. If you were able to determine the full cost, would it likely that some of those individuals sent overseas that the departments might send less? And that's the question to you, Mr. Ford, again, a, a yes or no? You don't know? I, I can't speak for the executive branch, sir. No, you're not hearing my question. 
Do you want to know if, if they would, if they well, would the, send the answer, people? The answer is, is a free service overutilized? And the answer is yes. So to the determination <laughs> of a free service. No, it's just by, by just the, the actual laws of it. Um, Mr. Sig uh, Ms. Sigmund? Uh, of course, it's difficult to, to uh, say concretely, but I'm assuming that uh, it would certainly be an a, a influential factor in right-sizing on the part of other agencies. I guess what I'm, with, with our formulas uh, and, the, and the concept that we would look at the cost and the mission uh, and, and security, um, we look at all three of those. It would just strike me that one of the things we could do pretty quickly is determine cost and at least uh, make sure that the cost is borne not by the State Department but bor borne by the tenants who go there. And I would strike me that we would probably need some uh, you would probably see uh, right then some contraction. Uh, you wanted to make another comment, Ms. Sidney? Well, only that uh, there are processes at work uh, in the embassy itself that assign various administrative costs. Uh, they're not perfect, but they do attempt to uh, distribute uh, and share costs. I think part of the problem, if I understand it, is that uh, the formula that different agencies use is different uh, in calculating those costs. And so I think that, uh, for example, some in Washington co administrative costs are attached to the cost of serving overseas. I think there has to be agreement among all of the participants on a standard formalization of what will be counted in those costs. The, the Department of Defense uh, cannot pass an audit. There are over a trillion dollars, $1.7 trillion uh, of basically tr uh, points that um, uh, of transactions that aren't auditable. Uh, and it blows me away. Uh, and we're working on it. But would someone explain to me why the State Department, we use the number 260 as the number of missions. I want to know if it's just too neat. 260, 60,000 people overseas. Ms. Ms. Da uh, Ambassador Davis, I'm sorry, I have not been properly addressing you. Uh, Ambassador Davis, uh, Ambassador Sigmund, and Ambassador Ito, I apologize. Actually, the number that I was using is about 263. So. 263, okay, that's the number we're going to use here. How about the number of employees overseas? The number of employees. Uh, we use the number of direct American hire employees is about 19,000. That's Americans across the board, not just for State Department. But okay. the number of employees total that we use overseas is about 46,000. And those are? Uh, that includes uh, direct hire Americans. It includes uh, foreign service nationals and um, it includes uh, personal service contractors and others. Why is it taking so long to agree on a common set of criteria for right sizing? What, what's the dispute and who's involved in this dispute? Um, sir, it's, when you talk about right sizing, I guess you have to talk about it in two parts. There's no dispute in terms of right sizing within uh, the State Department. But uh, the difficulty, I suppose, is the right sizing in terms of the, state, the other agencies. And I believe that the problem has been that there has <coughs> not been a sufficient uh, uh, interest to get the job done. And I believe that the interest is there now. For instance, right sizing is now a part of the president's agenda. And that gives an impetus to really focusing uh, much more on the actual process of right sizing. The, um, and obviously a, a focus of, of the secretaries. Because when, yes, he, was, when he was before the budget committee, he was very clear about his support. We've had a little bit of trouble getting GAO to get information from state. Uh, and I'd like to know, um, 
mission and bureaucratic program plans are an important part of planning documents, which state talks about as key to right-sizing. And what I'm told is the GAO has had difficulty getting these from state because state lawyers assert the program plans are pre-decisional. Is, is this being resolved, and can I be pretty comfortable that uh, GAO is going to get this information from now on? Uh, is this striking you out of the blue here? Excuse me, just a second. Yeah. Army? Uh, sir, we'll, uh, you are correct. Uh, we will have to take this discussion back to the Undersecretary for Management, and yeah. I'll get you an answer. We, we've had a little bit of trouble getting information out of the state. And in order for us to do our job, uh, when we ask GAO or the Inspector General to do certain things, and um, I, we would really like before the, the, the next year and a half to really make a dent, a significant dent in this problem. Um, and I think you would as well. And we could work, I think, better as a team. Um, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. To uh, Ambassador Sigmund, do you believe the department has all the resources it needs right now to secure its overseas facilities? I think that the department today is better positioned than it has been in previous years. Uh, uh, I think it still needs more resources, yes. Uh, your description uh, in the, of the U.S. Post in Nigeria? Yes. I found it troubling. In fact, a staffer from our committee entered the Foreign Service, and her first post was a visa line in Nigeria. She had some extremely troubling accounts of working there, both in terms of security and insufficient staffing. Do you think additional resources could be used throughout the world to enhance security? Uh, yes, sir, I do. And e even if we're not talking about um, building new facilities, couldn't many <clears throat> posts use significant upgrades that could be done more quickly than, let's say, building? I think it's important for the department to put in place processes and plans to use additional resources wisely, and I think it's in in is doing that now. Uh, in your testimony, you state that right-sizing cannot resolve all the problems we have today. Specifically, you cite insufficient resources. Uh, where could Congress most quickly and effectively uh, bring about additional resources? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your what, questions. At what point uh, do you have any specific recommendations for the Congress about uh, which, what resources should be brought to bear? Uh, I think in my statement I was referring to previous years when, in fact, uh, staffing shortages were allowed to develop. Decisions were taken, for example, in the 90s to uh, compensate for budget shortfalls by not hiring, so that hiring uh, levels went lower than attrition. It's in those areas that I was referring to, sir. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ford, uh, you state on page 19 of your written testimony that Maintaining our overseas presence is, quote, an enormous expense, particularly with current budget deficits, unquote. I was surprised to hear this, uh, in part because the current budget deficits uh, did not begin until uh, the President and this Congress passed a uh, tax cut which primarily benefited uh, those at the, in the top bracket. I was also surprised because I think the State Department budget, it's my own opinion, there is an absolute bargain. When you uh, compare it to the Defense Department budget, which I did in my uh, statement, uh, do you ever have any thoughts about the disparity between the money that this country spends on the Department of Defense and Department of State? And do you ever think that maybe if we spent more money in Department of State, we may not have to spend as much on Department of Defense? Uh. I don't think GAO has a view on it. Um, <laughs> okay, let me. Uh, answer. I mean, it, uh, you know, our our uh, we want the money that is going to be spent to be spent efficiently. That's the bottom line. Whether it's spent by DOD or State Department or anybody else in the federal government. Ambassador Davis. Sir, uh, we always uh, welcome additional resources, such as the resources that we got for the Diplomatic Readiness Initiative. I think that uh, this is uh, an instance 
uh, that I can happily, happily cite that the Congress has been extraordinarily supportive of the State Department, and we have shown that we have utilized uh, those uh, resources properly and are continuing to show that we are utilizing resources properly. So we appreciate uh, increased resources with our increased responsibilities in the world. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, to Ambassador Ito, um, I'm glad you're here to represent the Overseas Presence Advisory Panel. The <laughs> panel did a significant amount of work. I'd like to ask you to focus on one aspect of this work, which you referred to in your testimony, the question of overall resource and staffing. Now, according to the report, the panel noted the gap between our nation's goals and the resources it provides its overseas operations. The world's most powerful nation does not provide adequate security to its overseas personnel. Despite its leadership in developing and deploying technology, U.S. overseas facilities lack a common Internet and email communications network. The overseas facilities of the wealthiest nation in history are often overcrowded, deteriorating, and even shabby. Ambassador Ito, from what we've heard here today, it sounds like the panel's conclusion that the nation's overseas presence is essentially severely undercapitalized still holds. Is that right? Um, I think that uh, members of the panel, and I have communicated with several of them before I've uh, come here to testify here today in order to try to speak on their behalf and not just uh, my personal impressions, but I think members of the panel are uh, generally encouraged by a number of the trends that they've seen. I take it back to the time when we were actually writing the report and we consulted with a number of members of Congress and, uh, during that particular process, and members of Congress made the point that yes, they recognized that the Department of State did not have adequate resources, but they also argued that when given money in the past, on occasion, the Department of State did not spend those resources wisely. So one of the messages we brought back as a panel to the Department was that we need to make a commitment within the Department to reform. So it wasn't just an issue of resources that we could argue that if you made a commitment to reform practices in the Department of State to try to improve how we allocate these resources that we do get, we would actually improve the capability of making that argument to get additional resources. And uh, one of the areas where I think we're most encouraged is on the whole uh, overseas facilities issue, because at the time of the OPAP report, we recognized that there were uh, serious deficiencies in many of our overseas missions, and yet the rate at which we were able to address those deficiencies in our current strat uh, strategy under FBO was totally inadequate. It would take us 10 or 20 years in order to get just the embassies that were critically deficient in security areas to build, come up to speed. And that's Thank one you, of Ambassador. I, I want to ask, uh, you know, I was struck by the panel's conclusion, which was made in harsh terms, uh, said the condition of U.S. posts and missions abroad is unacceptable. The panel fears that our overseas presence is perilously close to the point of system failure. And you stated, New resources will be needed for security, technology, and training to upgrade facilities. In some countries where the bilateral relationship has become more important, additional posts may be needed to enhance the American presence or to meet new challenges. Where do you think we are in terms of getting overseas facilities up to minimum acceptable levels? I think that's one of the areas which has been a success story in terms of our recommendations and in terms of the Department and Administration's response. I think what OBO is doing now uh, really does meet the requirements and the goals of uh, our panel at this particular time. Likewise, on personnel resources, this is another area where we argue that there should be uh, additional resources for the department because we're seeing things like staffing gaps and uh, lots of problems as a result of uh, uh, inadequate uh, inflows of new foreign service officers. And as uh, Ambassador Davis indicated, the diplomatic readiness initiative has been supported by the Congress. We on the panel argued that we needed a 10 or 15 percent training float. I don't think we're quite there yet in order to be able to really train the people that we think need to come into the Foreign Service and also move upwards in terms of the management skills. But I think in terms of all three of those issues that you mentioned, starting with facilities, also in uh, human resource uh, uh, terms, and also on uh, information technology, we have made considerable progress. We haven't gotten there yet in terms of the unclassified communications technology, but we certainly are in much, much better shape than we were in 1999. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ruppersberger, and thank you, sir, for your patience. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, it, was a, it was a good committee. Uh, I know there's some questions you can't ask, and uh, we'd like to get into more detail, but I think overall, 
my impression of the committee is that we're, we're starting, there's the beginning of a reform. I think before you, even, you can start a reform, you have to have support from the top. And you've discussed that and you've, you've stated today that, that the President and uh, Secretary Powell, and I, I know I feel strongly that Secretary Powell is supporting just based on some of the briefings that, that we have had. Uh, I think part of what I see here is, first thing, you have different agencies. And there's always a problem with interagency cooperation or different systems, whatever. But what we need to do, I think, from an international point of view, from based on what I'm hearing today, is set up a system that is going to work, a system that will develop accountability. You're never going to get to the next level until you have accountability of what you're doing and be able to justify the expenses. And I agree with you, Mr. Ford, that right now there still is not that system in place. Um, and it, it needs to be if you're going to get the support to spend the money. And yet we've got, we've got to do it quickly because I think we can all agree after we hopefully win this war, uh, you're going to have more burden on you than ever. And you've got, you've got to be able to perform that mission, have the right people in the right place and the right facilities to, to, to do the job. Now, let me just ask you a couple questions, just try to get to the system, system arena. Number one, um, from a, do we have a, a database on personnel? Is there any, I mean, just in, forget just State Department as an example. Uh, I don't see how we can manage without having information. And with technology that exists here today, do we have a database uh, about where, how many overseas personnel we have, what they're doing, and can we tie in to, to find out how we can judge their performance? Does, does that exist at all? I don't care who answers the question. I mean, maybe I should ask you and then I'll ask Mr. Ford. Okay. If you want to start off, why don't you start now? Uh, for all of the uh, agencies that are overseas, I'm not aware of any centralized database. I know the State Department has probably the best database that's uh, available. Um, and um, is being if, used. If, if I had to go there to, if I had to go and get that answer, I'd probably go to Ruth and ask her if uh, they have that information. But uh, in terms of all of the presence overseas, I don't know if the State Department database has that or not. I, I'd have to defer to her on that. Uh, this, th this is a problem. It is a problem that is being worked on. Let me give you uh, some elements, uh, however. Including security problems that might exist because of that database? Uh, no. Oh, okay. it, 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 it's a problem that we haven't pulled together all of the various uh, technical applications that we have. For, for example, this is another one that we have to look at in, in two uh, forms. First of all, how many state personnel do we have overseas? And second, how many other agency personnel? In terms of the other agency personnel, we do have some read on the number of full-time direct hire personnel, and we have that under the NSDD 38 process. We keep relatively uh, uh, good records on that. Um, the problem being that we have more people than the people who are direct hire. We have, as I said, we have contractors, we have foreign service nationals, uh, we have people who are hired on personal services contracts. And so uh, we don't have one database that captures all of these people. Now, uh, ICAST captures some of that data. We have a personnel system called GEMS that captures the data for the State Department. We also now have a new system called the Post Profile System, which is a central database, a new central database at our post that has the information about uh, a direct hire as well as FSNs and other personnel. What I'm trying to say is that we've got a lot of strands out there and we need to develop to a system to consolidate and to pull it all together so that we can get the information that we Let need. Let me ask you this question about your mission. Uh, it seems to me the two areas of reform that you, you seem to, you need to get a better hold on who is there and what they're doing and how they're performing from, from accountability. We also need to look at the facilities end, capital, so to speak, and, and to develop uh, the, pl the planning techniques as far as what do we need for, from a security, from an intelligence point of view, from a, from a communications point of view, to make sure that we are looking down the road. Now, do we have 
a committee, I guess, I guess Mr. Ito, you might maybe answer this question. Do we, I believe, I've always felt very strongly that if you're going to, going to get the information on what you need, you go to the front line. I mean, managers sometimes get in the way of doing, doing business. And how, are, we, are we asking the, the users, the front line, throughout where the needs are as it relates not only now, but maybe down to the future on the capital end. And, and I know Secretary Powell is looking at this and, and is trying to, to get it moving, so to speak. But even the amount of money that's being put in, it seems very, very small because it's over a 15-year period, I think. The $16 billion is a 15-year period or 20-year period. Are we, are we addressing that and looking and talking to the front line about what we need from a facilities point of view? And where do you think we are right now? And what do we need? Long well, question. I'll have to defer to General Williams, but uh, just as a general observation, I think that uh, what the Department has done since the time of our report is to try to strengthen the planning process, and that is to come up with the strategic plan that they're working on right now, and also the MPP, the Mission Performance Plans, and also the BPP, Bureau Performance Plans, and basically requiring the missions to take a careful look at what their policy objectives are and how well their resources or what resources they require and both in terms of human resources and also physical resources, obviously, to try to protect those personnel over time. Uh, I think that as far as the panel is concerned, one of the things that we pointed out was the fact that we needed a kind of a long-term, comprehensive set of foreign policy goals that all of the agencies agreed to. What we have uh, right now, of course, is something called the International Affairs Strategic Plan, which actually is uh, out of date in terms of it does not reflect this administration's interest. This was issued in the year 2000, but it was something that was an overarching set of objectives, foreign policy objectives, uh, for all U.S. government agencies overseas. Our panel position was that we need to continue to have a document like that and not just a strategic plan that basically represents the views of the State Department with some other agencies, but basically have an overarching plan and then basically try to project your requirements uh, both in personnel terms and in physical security terms over time. I've always thought that uh, the military does a reasonably good job of planning because by uh, force projection requirements and also uh, procurement for weapon systems, they're really required to look 10 years or 20 years down the road. Uh, I'm afraid we at the State Department and other foreign policy agencies don't tend to have those kind of far horizons. I think that's one of the things that we should do, and we should also And we have should implement it then. I mean, I, I agree with you, and we need to start implementing. Um, I, I think my time is almost up, but, but General? Yes. If, if you would allow me, I would just like to speak specifically to the facilities uh, side of it. Uh, one of the first um, tasks that uh, Secretary Powell and I agreed upon at the early part of 2001 is that we needed a strategic uh, capital plan, which was never in existence. Uh, we prepared this during the first 120 days of, of 2001, uh, had it ready for publication and put it into the system the early part of the next year. Uh, this plan captured all of our uh, expected work and requirements over the next six years. Uh, it's a road map. It guides us. It has a priority. Uh, everyone understands it. The ambassadors have it. Members uh, the, of our committees uh, here in the Congress, OMB, and also the Secretary. So it puts us all on the same page. We know exactly what we're asking for and what it uh, is expected to cost and all the ramifications around it. In addition to that, we zero-based every post, every post and policed up all of the deferred maintenance, which had never been done before. We put that in a database in our uh, operation. So that's valued, for an example, today at about $700 million of deferred maintenance. So that coupled with the 160 or so buildings or new embassies that we need to apply new capital to is the program that we are currently executing. And we update these, um, uh, these plans and this database on a continuous basis. Just in conclusion, I, I think that from where, what I'm seeing and hearing so far, first thing, I think you have a good leader, and that's, that's the first prerequisite in management. You have good people, and that's the second. Then you have to, you have to give them their mission and hold, hold them accountable for, for performance and also give the resources. I think the one area that I think we need work on here is the be able to put together the systems 
based on the technology that we have today and to pull that together so that we can then analyze where we need to go. Because as performance goes up, cost goes down, and that cost can go right back into your, your operation to increase the, the monies that we need to do the things that we need to help you down the road. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to note the presence of Mr. Tierney who, uh, from Massachusetts who has been very involved in this issue and um, also point out that um, uh, the last questioner, while he's a new member, is, uh, serves on the Intelligence and um, obviously is getting some insights in this, uh, probably learning more than you wanted to know, I think. <laughs> the, um, I, I want to kind of feel a little more comfortable about what we're doing with this panel because uh, you all are wonderful resources here and we got six of you. Uh, Mr. Ford, your perspective is that we basically asked you to task this issue of right sizing from our perspective and, and you, are, you have done that quite well and you continue to do. Ms. Davis, you, you, my sense is that you are uh, in charge of this whole issue of right sizing as it relates to personnel primarily. Yes, in the State yeah. Department. And in the State Department as well. Uh, uh, General Williams, in the State Department, you're on the focus on the building sides so of this whole issue of right sizing. And Mr. Nigert, you're you're here, I I think primarily because you are a part of the State Department. We made you that AID, and and I I think there's probably some tension in terms of whether you should be in your own separate place or part of state, and that's something that's worked out by powers higher than you. Uh, but I would be interested to know how you see. Uh, AID and where it should be. So I'm going to come to you first uh, in my questioning. And uh, uh, Ambassador Sigmund, you, you are here uh, as your role as Inspector General. Your people do a lot of post or mission visits. Is that correct? That's correct. Sir. And, you, and you're looking to see, you know, are things working, even for getting right sizing, how are things going there? You're, you're kind of doing the audit of the, the you're, you're, you're making the, a, a, you're, you're viewing the sites and you're looking at it from the standpoint of right sizing. That's correct. In fact, we've made right sizing one of the issues that we look at now at every post. Okay. And Mr. Uh, Ambassador Ito, you as are here primarily, um, obviously as part of Inspector General, but because of your being on the President's advisory panel, um, that's kind of the perspective. So when I ask you some questions, I want you to all feel free to jump in from your perspective. Uh, Mr. Niger, uh, if you would uh, tell me um, how is how is AID doing by state? Um, you you have, for instance, a huge presence in South Africa. Huge is a strong word. You have a very large presence. Uh, is it the intent of the State Department to kind of consider you uh, as uh, embassy employees and put you there? Or are they saying you were going to send you out into the field a little bit? What can you tell me about that? Well, I can tell you that. Uh, is your mic on? in general and in uh, South Africa in particular. Uh, South Africa is one of our large, largest missions. I think we have 15 direct hire Americans there, so uh, huge is, is a relative term, but we also have a lot of the other categories that Ambassador Davis was talking about, personal services contractors, foreign service nationals. Um, I, I think these days, uh, post-90s, uh, post both the law and common sense tell us that we should be co-located with the Department of State wherever possible, largely for security reasons. Uh, obviously, AID goes back a long ways. We started out as part of state. In 79, we were separated out from state, and for the past four years, we've been back a part of state. Uh, we've always been, however, an instrument of U.S. foreign policy and see ourselves very much of, as part of the Secretary's team. Uh, we have some preferences on part of individuals within AID that they'd rather be right. outside, but well, I think I, the, yeah. our, our approach is clearly that we want to be part of state's operation overseas. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman Shays, if I could just chime in from the facility side, you're absolutely right. Uh, USAID has a very large uh, presence uh, in, the, in Africa in general. Uh, the two facilities that we just opened uh, which we're very proud of, Dar es Salaam and Tanzania. Uh, one of the largest USAID facilities we, we have of recent time was just open at the same time uh, conjunctively with our new embassy. 
Uh, we have plans, uh, but not the funds sorted out for Nairobi. We engineered the grounds and we are waiting now just simply for the funds and we'll do the same thing in Nairobi. Uh, we have a similar situation. Uh, these are new facilities I'm talking about in Kampala, Uganda, uh, which was built um, over a year and a half ago. We have engineered, uh, pre-engineered the grounds and landscaped and uh, master plan for USAID facility, again, waiting on funds. Six other locations in Africa, South Africa, New Consulate going in, Abidjan, Conakry. Uh, uh, but they're part of the compound, or are they no, separate? No, these are separate buildings. Um, these are separate in buildings. In the only. compound or, or in the... T on the compound with yeah. us. See, one of the, I would think, and, and Mr. Niger, you can tell me, as a former Peace Corps volunteer, uh, we were obviously attempting to do right by the countries that we served. We knew that we were um, uh, American citizens who were uh, bringing the ideals of, of our great country overseas and respecting the culture of the people we were serving in. But we, we didn't think of ourselves as, a, as, in a sense, an instrument of our, our, our foreign policy. Uh, and there would be a desire on the part of Peace Corps volunteers to be with uh, the, the, the men and women and children and so on that the, the host country folks to, to, to be among them. I would think that the culture and the idea is somewhat similar. I, I think the culture is somewhat similar, Mr. Chairman. I think we'll probably find that almost a majority of our foreign service officers are former Peace Corps volunteers. Right. So they have the same background that you do in that respect. However, I mentioned in my prepared statement that the size of our overseas direct hire staff now is just slightly more than half of what it was 13 years ago. The result, in part, is that AID is not really implementing programs. In other words, our people are not out in the field as much as they used to be 15, 20 years ago, perhaps when you were overseas. And so uh, it's the indigenous folk. Uh, uh, beg your pardon? It's indigenous people that are, are there, basically the, the host country nationals that are basically carrying out the work? We have a good number of indigenous post country private and voluntary organizations and firms. We also have a good number of U.S. universities, PVOs, companies contractors. working for us. So contractors. Like yeah, basically who, contractors. Yeah. Who generally are not co located with us. We do, one difference that we have from okay, the embassy just, slightly like, yes, sir. is that our interest, as you say, is primarily in dealing with, with the people. Our needs for security in terms of, of classified information are much less than those of the State Department. And that is what bodes in terms of perhaps having a separate building in some cases on the embassy mm -hmm. compound. And we've worked very closely with, uh, with General Williams and his staff to see the cases where we can do that. Uh, the, uh, let me just be clear, uh, Ambassador Davis. When, when I hear um, the number 46,000 total, 19,000 uh, American citizens. Is that correct? No, yeah, but I was saying, sir, I was saying 19,000, it represents the number of U.S. direct mm -hmm. hire. Mm -hmm. That includes uh, the other agencies as well. Right, that you, you anticipated my question. But does it also include contractors? No, it's only U.S. direct hire. And, and so whose obligation in security-wise is, and housing-wise, we don't have a challenge, right? Is that right, General? We don't have to house the contractors? Uh, no. Um, but in, in terms of security, obviously, American citizens that have to be... It falls is, under the, uh, uh, the responsibility of the chief of mission. But right, but not under your responsibility as head of personnel. The security, no. Yeah, no. The, the yeah, the focus. Well, even the contract. You don't you don't interface directly or have control over the contractors. No. Okay. No. Uh, you. Uh, I, I want to say, Ms. Dave, Ambassador Davis, you kind of won my heart early on by your answer to one of my questions. Why has it taken so long to agree on a common set of criteria for right sizing? I love honest, succinct answers. It's, it wasn't a priority, it is now. And that explains a lot. It got rid of a lot of questions I wanted to ask you <laughs> after that. Um, I'd like to know, um, why should state incorporate the GAO right sizing framework into its mission performance plan? Uh, that would be open, I guess, to 
uh, you and uh, and the general. To me, um, mm -hmm. first of all, I'd like to say that uh, we obviously have reviewed the plan and we find it uh, very useful. We find that it uh, has it addresses with the three uh, uh, basic uh, legs, which is mission, security, and cost, it addresses issues that we are very interested in. And it also addresses issues that our chief of missions just generally do uh, address. S consequently, uh, we have taken a look at uh, the framework and have utilized it to a certain extent in our mission uh, program plan. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I would just like to say for our business, uh, getting the seat number right from the beginning uh, is really what drives the size. Getting the what, I'm sorry? The this, this seat, um, the present number. Getting the number of personnel that's going to be served at a particular post uh, is is absolutely paramount for our business because it drives the size of the building, which ultimately drives the budget and, and so on. So we are very interested in getting the number uh, of the population that is anticipated to be served right uh, in the beginning so that we can size and build the building correctly because our formula today is to build to the right size build to the right size and then also build in some growth percentages so that uh, over time if there is some tweaks to that number we can do that so we are very interested in in the whole issue of right sizing okay would you explain to me how the state plans to implement the gao criteria I, in other words accepting it as one thing how does it get implemented well first of all uh we would hope once the plan is, is put in place, uh, we would uh, take, we would use the results of this plan to, to ensure that um, we, as I said, do that front end planning correctly, uh, get in the, the types of uh, seats, uh, whether they're unclassified or classified, correct, so that we can size and, and uh, build a building correctly. Ambassador Davis, how would we be implementing the GAO criteria? How, what would be a concrete way that you're starting to do that? Uh, we, we have uh, included some of the elements in our, um, in our mission uh, program performance plan. And I think the most concrete way is uh, to ensure it, 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 our chiefs of mission, a uh, number of chiefs of mission have taken a look at the framework and they have said that as a matter of fact, it encompasses many of the issues that they have uh, talked about and studied in terms of uh, developing the mission program plan in any event. And I think that what we are doing is our, uh, our our uh, resource management uh, bureau is taking a look at how it might be better incorporated into the planning process. How do we, and maybe Mr. Ford, you'd want to jump in, how do you integrate the cost, the security, and the mission between the tenants, for lack of other name, and the State Department? In other words, I can see the State Department using this as a basis for their own uh, allocation. But um, the 19,000 employees include more than state, correct, um, Ms. Day Ambassador Davis? Yes. And, and, and so you technically have about how much control over, of the 19, only a third are approximately your, your, your State Department. You clearly have direct control over them. Describe to me now what kind of control you would have on the two-thirds that aren't state. Okay, sir, the, the chief of mission has a responsibility as uh, designated to the chief of mission 
by the President of the United States in the President's letter of instructions. Yeah, and we have a few Presidents. Uh, we have a few Presidents that have made that point. Yes. Uh, but we don't really have uh, an example yet that it's been implemented, that part of it. Control by state over uh, the tenants, in a sense. In theory, it's there. Uh, in practice, it's not. In, 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 in theory, it's there. The uh, chief of mission is charged with uh, working with the various... I know that. I visited with too many ambassadors and chiefs of missions, and they all make it very clear that, in theory, that's true. But, in fact, they don't have day-to-day -day control. They might, oh, have, gen they might that, have general... That is correct. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know why they're there in some cases. I mean, if we're being, you know, in the spirit that you answered my question, you know, they, they, they don't know why they're there. They assume that they're doing some good. Uh, and they know in many cases they are. Uh, there's interaction with state, employ state Department uh, individuals and non-state. They interact. But there's no master plan where the ambassador says, this is really great for my mission. I, I guess there the, are the two issues here, sir. Number one, it would be better if the ambassadors were able to get in on the NSDD 38 process earlier in the game. In many instances, when people are assigned, when agencies wish to put new positions at the uh, mission, the, they have already run the request by OMB, and they've already received the funding uh, for the position. So the chief of mission doesn't have very much uh, say-so at that late stage of the game. The other thing is that the chief of mission would benefit a great deal if the chief of mission were able to, uh, to uh, designate that uh, funding from various programs, from uh, agencies, be utilized, uh, sort of have some cross-jurisdictional possibility of utilizing funding. One, one of the, the things that I saw and my staff saw as well was the uh, fact that some of the tenants had greater resources yes. than others. So they could do things that their counterparts in state couldn't do. And, and the chief of mission does not have the authority to say that if you have a, a, a healthy, a more healthy amount of funds than another agency or another program, then you can't tell another agency that you're going to reprogram some of those funds. That's the problem. Okay. So um, my question was to you, does the chief of mission have the tools to properly right-side his or her post? The answer, I think, from your answers is no. I didn't ask the question, but you basically have answered that. And uh, what I would want to know is what authority does the chief of mission have to have to prevent new staff from coming on post? Uh, the, 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 the authority is there. The authority is there in the president's letter and in the law. But in practice, what happens is uh, that the chief of mission gets involved in the process at a later date. Uh, once a number of decisions are already made back in Washington, what the chief of mission needs is to be involved in the process right up front. When uh, agencies start to discuss uh, new positions before they get the uh, okay of uh, OMB and before they are included in the budgets, chief of missions should be consulted. Would it be fair to say that, um, that a chief of mission ha has the ability to re remove someone from post to State Department uh, but really does not have the authority to move someone uh, on a mission who's a tenant? Uh, no, sir. Uh, ch you, mean in ter oh, you mean in terms of the position or in terms of the person? I have 400 employees in the embassy. I'm the ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, One-third are state. Two-thirds mm -hmm. are non-state. They're, they're good government officials. They're treasury. They're, they're, um, 
their FBI, their transportation, their agriculture, uh, their justice folks, their commerce. Okay, they're all there. Do I have the ability to uh, say that we don't need any of these individuals and ask them to leave? NSDD 38 actually does provide for the reduction of the, the process through which a chief of mission would go to reduce the staff at another agency. Can you, can you cite any example where you know this authority has been used? To reduce the staff? No, I cannot. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Ito, tell me this dialogue that I'm having right now. Tell me how you react to it that we're, we're having with this. Well, Mr. Chairman, in my prepared remarks, uh, I think I gave you a fairly um, upbeat assessment from an OPAP panel member in terms of how well our recommendations across the board, I think, have been accepted, uh, certainly exceeded our expectations in many areas. But I think one of the areas where we've been disappointed is in this whole area of right sizing. Because, uh, as I suggested, I think uh, that getting OMB involved is certainly a good thing. The State Department certainly is taking this process much, much more seriously. If I could interrupt you just a second. I mean, OMB is, would strike me as being key because they basically have budgetary oversight over all departments. That's correct. Right. Okay. Uh, and I think that the fact that the administration has chosen for OMB to get involved, I think, is a good, good, good uh, uh, development for that particular reason. But. Our original OPAP recommendation was the creation of a committee which would be created by the President of the United States and chaired by the Secretary of State with all of the major foreign policy agencies represented at this committee to then review all staffing requirements worldwide to be able to determine appropriate levels of staffing and link those appropriate levels of staffing directly to the International Affairs Strategic Plan. That was our goal. We still feel like anything short of that probably is not going to work because an awful lot of what we've been talking about here is right-sizing but only involving the Department of State and maybe a few other agencies that are willing to go along in the process. But ultimately, I would think that the process that we described back in 1999, and that was that the NSCD 38 uh, structure was, was basically flawed or was not working properly at that time, I don't think that's really changed fundamentally. We do have a much stronger letter from the President uh, in terms of uh, underscoring chief of mission authority, but I think in practical terms, it's really not going to work unless you've got uh, the authority from the very top and judgments taken from the very top to determine what our staffing should be. I would just cite the example from my three years in Thailand, and that is that certain agencies who did not have a successful time in terms of going to their appropriations committee and getting the resources, and specifically the State Department, uh, specifically USAID and USIS, we found that those numbers went down considerably during that period of time. On the other hand, of course, law enforcement agencies were quite successful to make the argument to their committees that by stationing people overseas, you were actually serving the best interests of the American people by having those facilities overseas. And so from an NSCD 38 position, and particularly from my role as ambassador, it was very, very difficult for us to assess uh, those particular judgments. Certainly you, you, you couldn't argue against You were ambassador for how long in Thailand? Three years in Thailand. And about uh, how many uh, uh, of your um, uh, uh, at the mission were State Department employees there? About a third? Or? We had, uh, at one point, we had 570 authorized positions, of which State Department had approximately 35 percent of those positions. Mm -hmm. Now, is it fair to say that you, you knew you had direct control over that 35 percent, but that it, it, the others you were more in a negotiating role? Well, I don't think negotiating role is quite it. I think it depends a, a lot on the individual ambassador, but I did think, you know, you are the president's representative and not just the State Department's representative. Uh, but an awful lot of how it works on a practical basis is the relationship that an ambassador establishes with the heads of the different agencies at post. And I think Bangkok is a good example of how uh, you do get fairly good interagency cooperation on U.S. foreign policy goals, such as counter-narcotics. On the other hand, it is very, very clear that since we don't have budget control over the other agencies that send their personnel to post, that you really don't ultimately have control over the numbers. Yeah. I, I mean, you can, make, you can make tactical arguments back and forth, but uh, the reality is that agencies that are able to make the case 
in terms of and, and are able to fund their positions overseas are the ones that are going to put their people overseas. So you, you might have DEA officials, uh, and, and they are doing, and I think it's important for the record to, to note, they're doing very important roles. For instance, uh, dealing with uh, illegal drugs, treasury, illegal financing, commerce, promoting businesses, all of those are noble. But did you, did you feel intuitively that you, um, you had the right combination or did you feel that it was sometimes weighted towards certain areas and not enough in other areas? Well, I think uh, the thing that disturbed me a bit was the fact that um, while at that point we had arguably the second or third largest U.S. Embassy operating overseas because we did a lot of functional uh, and regional operations out of Bangkok, but what was happening was that over time a lot of the instruments of foreign policy that were engaging with the public at large in Thailand were being cut back. For example, two years before I arrived at Post, we cut two of our consulates in Songkla down south and in, in Udorn up north. We also ended, we closed USAID's presence in 1995 on a bilateral basis, and in 1996 we went ahead and closed the regional mission. We also closed our cultural affairs section in Chiang Mai. We also cut half of our US-based USIS information service people in the embassy in Bangkok. USIS is? The um, U.S. Uh, US Information Agency right, personnel. But, but is that under the State Department? Well, at that point, they were not. Okay. But, but I guess my point is, is that at a time when we were actually increasing law enforcement and intelligence gathering activities in Thailand, all of which were totally uh, understandable and something that I supported, nonetheless, decisions were made in Washington largely on budgetary reasons by individual agencies that could not sustain their presence overseas. So the end result was that after a four or five year period, we had a much, much different profile in Thailand than we started out to be. And I would also argue that what and that's was happening... in spite of the fact that they weren't paying the true costs. That's true. I mean, in... in and so if they were paying the true cost... I, mean, I believe in the, in the concept of opportunity cost. I mean, you, 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 you do one thing and you give up doing something else. And I do think cost is an important factor in how much you value that, that activity. So, but at any rate, even then, given what we were doing in budgets, that you, you were seeing some reductions. Well, part of that, of course, is a function, as I suggested, of some agencies were more successful than others. And at that time, of course, the State Department is not doing well. So right. one of the arguments for closing our consulates and, in fact, reducing some of our reporting uh, positions had to do with other priorities as we were opening posts elsewhere. So we ended up having, after three or four years, I think a much different kind of an embassy in terms of where our priorities were. And, I'm, and I, I guess the argument I would make about relating that to a strategic plan is that I'm not entirely sure that that's where our overall foreign policy interests are best served. And yet, for a whole variety of reasons, that's what we ended up with, a much, much different kind of an embassy than we started five years before. Okay. Anybody want to jump in before I get to another? I won't keep you much longer. Any, anybody want to comment on what we talked about in the last few minutes? How have um, staffing levels changed since the attacks on September 11th overseas? The, there have been some changes, and basically those changes are in the increase of uh, other agencies uh, overseas. The State Department's remained, uh, the State Department has grown as well, but the numbers, there, there's not been any sort of uh, uncontrollable growth, I'd say, because the number has stayed pretty stable. But the increase basically has been in other agencies overseas because of uh, issues such as uh, uh, the focus on uh, counterterrorism, because of increasing. Um, because of increasing uh, demands on our consular service uh, for uh, border security and those types of issues. Okay, I'm going to conclude when I do and ask what the biggest obstacle to meaningful right sizing is. And I'd like each of you to be able to, to tell me what you think the biggest obstacles are. So I'd just like you to think about that. But let me, before I do that, what, I'd like to talk about the whole issue of cost. Uh, excuse me, I would like to first have some of you described to me the tension between mission 
and security. And maybe, um, General Williams, you could do this. When you, when you um, get in a dialogue, when you look at an embassy, is your first focus mission or is your first focus security or what? First of all, the, the foremost uh, concern in our mind is to build a secure facility for the number of people that we have been told will occupy the facility. Right. So my focus is to make absolutely certain that the number that we are providing this secure facility is right, and then the focus goes on doing a security building. That's my focus. Yeah. Okay. Our, I think the first uh, focus would be on mission, because if you, if 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 there is not a, if the mission does not fit into the priorities and uh, the goals and objectives of U.S. foreign policy, then uh, we don't get as far as the security. So for, for me, I think that mission is actually the first. And then a, a higher power will resolve the differences, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, it's fair to say, General, that there are some facilities that are extraordinarily vulnerable. Yes. Um, and it's no secret. They're right along major streets. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it makes me think when I've had dialogue with some of my constituents as threatened as they feel. Um, and as concerned as first responders are. Uh, there's no question that uh, in terms of a priority, we still have a significant ways to go with our embassies. Is that not true? That is correct. Yeah. And Congressman Shays, I'll just add this in. Uh, I travel an awful lot, and when we encounter a particular facility that obviously is in harm's way, uh, from a security standpoint, we feel it's our duty to come back and point this out uh, to, um, to our regional bureaus to make certain that we, we are looking at this in a holistic way. And uh, there is dialogue, and I might point out it's healthy dialogue that's, take, that's taken place. Um, so uh, I think it's, um, it's working quite well. Okay, I'm going to try to finish up in the next 15 minutes. Let me just uh, be clear. We talked about cost. Um, I I'd like to, I'd like to just make sure we have a little bit of a dialogue about it. I'd like to know what the unresolved issues in cost-sharing proposals. What are the unresolved issues? As it stands now, uh, this, quite frankly, I'm glad to. And I'm to, throwing this up to everyone, but I'm right. happy, General, to have you jump in. Right. I'm, I'm glad to get to this one, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I frankly believe that um, this gives us uh, the best opportunity, I think, to help uh, the Chief of Mission and our department um, get uh, the right sizing. Because if a tenant knows that before uh, new additions or initial uh, personnel are sent to a particular post, uh, the, there's a cost sharing mechanism in place. This makes the process ordered from the very beginning. And the, one of the reasons now I think that it's a little difficult to control is because um, the only effort involved here is to make a request. And we think that this cost-sharing issue will do two things. Number one, it'll put more money in the coffer to allow us to move ahead and build facilities uh, quicker and get out of harm's way and, and get this matter behind us that was identified some Why do you think it will be quicker? Pardon me, sir? Why do you think it will be quicker? Well, because um, if we are able to implement the cost sharing along the lines that we have suggested, um, the additional funds that would be generated as a function of a tenant paying, uh, uh, paying a, a uh, prorated share per seat and the type right. of seat, this would generate more available funds per year in order to okay. apply to the new embassy construction. Anybody else want to jump in? Yes. 
Mr. Ford. Yeah, I think some of the issues, this is the uh, devil's in details. Uh, I think there's a lot of unresolved issues based on what we've heard from discussions with the general and with uh, OMB on uh, issues of how you're going to calculate cost sharing, whether or not the tenants will be able to uh, uh, secure funding from the various uh, funding uh, agencies here in Congress, uh, the different differentials in cost between, say, classified space and unclassified space. So there's a lot of details to this that I think are going to have to be worked out. In yes, order to create an incentive for the for everybody to uh, sign up to this, and, and is this in a sense almost buying a, a space in a condominium, uh, uh, or uh, in other words, once they've paid this cost, do the, does that entitle them to use this space indefinitely, even if they don't need it, or do they sell it? Well, does I think that, that um, I think that's a. a, a a possibility. We did some work recently with the Department of Agriculture, which in which they felt that some residences that they had uh, lived in for many, many, many years uh, uh, should be managed by them instead of uh, General Williams. And uh, so I think I think it's a possibility that if someone feels like, hey, I paid my fair share, therefore it's my my place, I can stay there forever. I think that's an issue. Yeah, but that, and that's not a healthy issue. I mean, no. yeah. No. So I mean, it's easier for us to allocate costs in rented space, correct? That is correct. Yeah. But so why can't we just determine the square footage based on capital and just charge them a rent? Well, because um, I, I just think if you start getting them to pay the capital costs, you, you end up with some absurd challenges in the future. Well, we have, we have looked at this, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, very, very hard. We've had the support and, um, and the advice of our industry advisory panel, um, which uh, helps us along these lines. And they suggested very strongly that um, uh, we stay away from the, the rent type of concept and deal with uh, a sharing formula that was very simple to implement on seats. If you require, in the case of USAID, a certain type of space, which would be an unclassified uh, space primarily in a USAID situation, uh, it's only fair to charge USAID for what they are really buying, and that's an unclassified seat. On the other hand, if the Department of Defense, my whole world, if uh, you are requiring classified space, and most of them do, then you pay a prorater share. Yeah, that part I understand. I yeah. totally understand. But I, right. don't, I, and I, I don't have to spend the time of the hearing to really. Yeah. It's just a question that we won't probably resolve now. I just. It seems to me having these uh, various departments and agencies almost have ownership uh, creates problems in the future, and takes away even more gives takes away even more control from state. Right. Right. Uh, I would I, 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 I just, maybe I could just ask um, our inspector general to comment, or maybe even AID would like to comment based on past experience, or um, Mr. Ambassador Ito. Does it, does it make sense to, to try to have them capitalize the cost, or does it make sense and to, to basically feel like they've paid, bought a part of the facility, or does it make better sense to have them be paying a cost of what would be a square footage cost in any other building? Actually, in the OPAP recommendations, we actually recommended both. We thought that there should be rent, in other words, uh, a situation right. similar to what GSA does domestically in the United States, and that there also should be an assessment for future capital construction, particularly to meet the security requirements that we were faced with in this building campaign. The other, um, the other interesting point in our discussions back and forth on that is that we felt that by moving these costs to all of the agencies that would have personnel overseas, that in actual fact, they would then have to go to all of their uh, subcommittees to make the case that the cost associated with their presence overseas was going to be considerably more than it had been in the past. And we thought that that was a good thing because it would actually involve a broader sector of the Congress in an effort to understand exactly what all these agencies well, are what, doing What overseas. you're describing, though, is just, to me, is just making sure we identify the true cost and have them pay the true cost. Let me uh, ask each of you, uh, what has been, in your judgment, the largest obstacle to meaningful right-sizing in the federal government? Why don't I start with you, Ms. Uh, Ambassador Ito? 
Well, I think uh, to me the answer is, is really leadership and the commitment of leadership to be able to accomplish this. Uh, this is not an easy task, particularly the, sites, the right sizing concept. And I must say that while we could come together with a notion and a suggestion that there be an interagency committee created by the president, chaired by the secretary of state, getting that to, to a point of reality we recognize is a very, very difficult undertaking. But I think what needs to be done is just as in the State Department, I think the Secretary of State and certainly General Williams have demonstrated that the engagement of the leadership at the very top on management issues like this really makes the difference. I'm a little worried, quite frankly, what happens if General Williams decides to leave us anytime soon, because I would hope that what we've been able to create under his leadership can be sustained over time. I understand but I he's think the point a few is, heads together. <laughs> exactly. But I think the point is that I think it takes a commitment of leadership from the very top to be able to accomplish these very, very difficult undertakings. Okay. I also think that Ambassador Davis was correct in that right-sizing has to be made a priority. Uh, I think in, in principle, our chiefs of mission have been uh, empowered to engage in right-sizing through the NSDD 38 process, but in practice, they haven't been. And all too often, we find that uh, through the use of TDY processes or through uh, uh, assigning Americans directly to a host government entity, that NSDD right-sizing instrument is weakened considerably. All too often, ambassadors uh, get last-minute notification that personnel will be arriving, and it's a trade-off at that point between implementing uh, important programs or refusing personnel who have been identified as being in the national interest, and that's a lot of pressure to put on an ambassador. He needs to begin be in the process at the beginning, and he needs to be truly empowered to make those right-sizing decisions. If I had said he, my wife would have corrected she. me right away. She. <laughs> so it was really fun for me to have that opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Mr. Niger. Yeah, I, I would say leadership, too, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess it's not so much the case with AID, but for the other cabinet agencies who are overseas, in a number of cases, their missions are different, in their view at least, right. from, from that of the Department of State. And I think the, the exercise that the, the center of the executive branch, OMB, is now going to be going through on right-sizing that will involve not only the department and us, but the other agencies as well, will bring kind of a new equality or equity, if you will, to the, uh, to the right-sizing process. And the fact that uh, the administration has taken this one on and is prepared to run with it, I think gives us the first hope that, uh, that it really will be a priority, as Ambassador Davis said earlier. I think that's, that's been the problem. Without question, Mr. Chairman, his leadership and the general acceptance of, uh, of reality. Uh, we simply have to do something different and, and uh, uh, and pronounced that will allow us to get out of this uh, this fix. I would, ag I would agree with all of my colleagues. I would uh, simply add that I think uh, one of the blocks to appropriate right sizing is the attitude that right sizing means downsizing, and that is a dangerous uh, proposition. Right sizing does not as the council said earlier in this presentation, mean downsizing. I figured out why I have an affection for you, Ambassador and, and General, because my first contact with the State Department, I felt they spoke in tongues. Mm -hmm. And I can actually understand what you men and women are saying to me, which is, uh, <laughs> it, which is wonderful. I, I, hope, uh, I hope it spreads, uh, Mr. Ford. <laughs> Well, I agree with everyone else on the panel. I think you have to have leadership, you have to have commitment, and you've got to create some incentives for uh, all of the agencies that have post people overseas to want to do this. And I think that's going to be the big hurdle because uh, the ambassadors clearly don't have the wherewithal or the interest in uh, pursuing this. And unless we get somebody at a fairly high level, uh, be it the Secretary of State or OMB, to really uh, force this issue, over and make it sustained because I'm afraid uh, you know these things can come and go. If there's not a sustained level of effort here, then I'm afraid that the uh, the fruits of labor are not going to are not going to carry be carried out on this program. Um, I um, 
I'm very impressed with all of you and uh, feel we're very fortunate as a country to have your service, so I thank you for that. Um, I'd allow you to, uh, or encourage you to uh, make any closing comment. Is there anything that we needed to put on the record, we haven't put on the record, that you feel should be put on the record? I, I would just like to leave, uh, Mr. Chairman, with, uh, with one point, uh, because it's very um, significant and, and has so much linkage to this um, difficult situation and discussion we've had today. I think uh, the fact that we have worked hard and put in place with great support from our Secretary of State, he's been leading the battle here, to put in place a framework now framework for our government to, to get out of this uh, situation that the OPEF um, so rightly uh, pointed out, um, that uh, we try our very best to, to, make, um, to make this go. Uh, I will commit uh, to work as hard as I can, as I've done for the last um, uh, two years, to try to uh, point this in the proper direction. It's a lot of work to be done, and uh, I appreciate the support of the Congress to date, and, and I hope that we can uh, continue to have this support to stay the course. Any other comments? Well, the promise is, if we do it right, uh, we may have more or less people working, but they will, uh, we will have uh, used our resources better, will be better focused, will be better able to protect them, uh, and the mission of our government will uh, uh, make a lot more sense. Um, it's um, clearly a task that we should all want to do, and um, I think that uh, uh, we are seeing that leadership, and we are seeing that priority being given, uh, and we're also seeing it being backed up with, um, I think, uh, very outstanding employees who want to make it work. So. With that, uh, we will adjourn this hearing. Thank you. Next, speeches by Senator Ted Stevens and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi.